Hey everybody, it's Retro DM Ray again today. I am back with you with another in my uh, series of reading through the Best of Dragons. Today I am back in the Best of Dragon um, Volume 1, and this is both from the st Strategic Review and uh, the Dragon Volumes 1 and 2. Um, this came out in 1985, but many of these articles are from the late 70s. Um, and again, we are going to hear today from uh, the master himself, uh, Mr. Gary Gygax, in an article entitled The Dungeons and Dragons Magic System. So I hope you're going to enjoy listening to this one today um, and consider some of the uh, background of the uh, quote-unquote Vancean system that is used and a little bit of the impetus as to why and, and kind of uh, the, the history behind that a little bit. Um, again, if you like this content, please give me a thumbs up, hit that like, that subscribe, uh, click the bell icon if you want to be notified when I get new videos uploaded, um, and certainly please share. Um, I'm on a, a good subscriber push right now to get to my 500, to push towards 1,000 if I possibly can. I'd really, really love to get there. Um, check out the links um, in the video as well as to how to support the channel, and let's uh, dig into our article and get started. Okay. So, The Dungeons and Dragons Magic System by Gary Gygax. Because there are many legendary and authored systems of magic, many questions about the system of magic used in D&D are continually raised. Magic in chainmail was fairly brief, and because it was limited to the concept of tabletop miniatures, there was no problem in devising and handling this new and very potent factor in the game. The same cannot be said of D&D. While miniature battles on the tabletop were conceived as part of the overall game system, the major factor was always envisioned as the underworld adventure, while the wilderness trek assumed a secondary role. Various other aspects took a third place, and only then were miniature battles considered. So a somewhat different concept of magic had to be devised to employ with the D&D campaign in order to make it all work. The four cardinal types of magic are those systems which require long conjuration with much paraphernalia as an adjunct, as used in Shakespeare and Macbeth, or as typically written by Robert E. Howard in his Conan Yarns, the relatively short-spoken spell, as in Finnish mythology, or as found in the superb fantasy of Jack Vance, ultra-powerful, if not always correct, magic typical of De Camp and Pratt in their classic Harold Shea stories, and the generally weak and relatively ineffectual magic, as found in J.R.R. Tolkien's work. Now, the use of magic in the game was one of the most appealing aspects, and given the game system, it was fairly obvious that its employment could not be on the complicated and time-consuming plane any more than it could be made as a rather weak and ineffectual adjunct to swordplay if magic users were to become a class of player character. The basic assumption, then, was that D&D magic worked on a quote-unquote Vancean system, and if used correctly, would be a highly powerful and effective force. There are also four basic parts to magic. The verbal or uttered spell, the somatic or physical movement required for the conjuration, the psychic or mental attitude necessary to cast the spell, and the material adjuncts by which the spell can be completed. To cite an obvious example, water to raise a water elemental. It was assumed that the D&D spell would be primarily verbal, although in some instances the spell would require some somatic component also, a fireball being an outstanding example. The psychic, per se, would play little part in the basic magic system, but a corollary, mnemonics, would. The least part of magic would be the material aids required, and most of those considered stored or aided magic, so as to enable its more immediate enjoyment, rather than serving to prolong spellcasting time or encumber the player using these aids. Before exploring the whys and wherefores of these decisions, a further word regarding magical results must be said. Spells do various things, and just what they do is an important consideration, for some order of effect in regard to the game would have to be determined. Magic purports to have these sorts of effects. 1. The alteration of existing substance, including its transposition or dissolution. 2. The creation of a new substance. 3. The changing of normal functions of mind and or body. 4. The addition of new functions to mind and or body. 5. Summon and or command existing entities, and six, create new entities. In considering these functions, comparably weak and strong spells could be devised from any one of the six. Knowing the parameters within which the work was to be done, that then enabled the creation of the system. 
because the magic using D&D player would have to ha be able to operate competitively with fellow players who relied on other forms of attack during the course of adventures, the already mentioned Vancian system was used as a basis, and spells of various sorts were carefully selected. Note, however, that they were selected within the framework of D&D competition primarily, and some relatively powerful spells were apportioned to lower levels of magic use. Charm, Person, and Sleep at first level are outstanding examples. The effects of some spells are set to reflect the level of the magic user employing them. Many of the spells were developed for specific use in dungeon expeditions or during wilderness adventures. A few, mostly drawn from chainmail, were included in the tabletop battle in mind. With the tabletop battle in mind. Sorry. All such spells were assumed to be of such a nature so that no less than three of the four basic components of magic were required in their use. All spells were assumed to have a verbal component. Each and every spell, not found on a scroll or otherwise contained in or on some magical device, would be absolutely mnemonic. Magic users would have to memorize the spells they wished to have available, and when a particular spell was recalled and its other parts enacted, then the memory would be gone and the spell no longer available until it was rememorized. Thus, the magic user's spellbooks. Most spells were also envisioned as containing a slight somatic and or material component whether in the preparation of a small packet of magical or ordinary compounds to be used when the spell was broken or was spoken, or as various gestures to be made when the enchantment was uttered. Magic use was thereby to be powerful enough to enable its followers to compete with any other type of player character, and yet the use of magic would not be so great as to make those using it overshadow all others. This was the conception, but in practice it did not work out as planned. Primarily at fault is the game system itself, which does not carefully explain the reasoning behind the magic system. Although various magic items for employment by magic users tend to make them too powerful in relation to other classes, although the Greyhawk supplement took steps to correct this somewhat, the problem is further compounded by the original misconceptions of how magic work in D&D, misconceptions held by many players. The principle here is that the one first-level spell allowable to a first-level magic user could be used endlessly, or perhaps at, in, at frequent intervals, without the magic, magic user having to spend time and effort rememorizing and preparing again after the single usage. Many players also originally thought scrolls containing spells could be reused, reused as often as desired. Finally, many dungeon masters geared their campaigns to the level of TV giveaway shows with gold pouring into players' purses like water and magical rewards strapped to the backs of lowly rats. This latter allowed their players to progress far too rapidly and go far beyond the bounds of D&D's com competition scope, magic users, fighters, clerics, and all. To further compound the difficulties, many dungeon masters and players, upon learning of the more restrictive intent of the rules, balked. They enjoyed the comic book characters, incredible spells, and stratospheric levels of their way of playing. Well and good. D&D is, if nothing else, a freeform game system, and if it, it was designed with great variation between campaigns to be allowed for, nay, encouraged. Of course, there are some variations which are so far removed from the original framework as to be totally irreconcilable with D&D. These have become games of other sorts, and not a concern of this article. On the other hand, there are many campaigns which were scrapped, and begun afresh after the dungeon masters consulted us or after they read other articles pertaining to the play of D&D &D as conceived by its authors. Just as there will probably be some dungeon masters ready to try again after reading this far. It is for all these referees and their players, as well as those who have played the game pretty much as was desired, but never quite positive that you were actually doing so, that the foregoing was written. The logic behind it was all drawn from the game balance as much as from anything else, Fighters have their strength, weapons, armor to aid them in their competition. Magic users must rely on their spells, as they have virtually no weaponry or armor to protect them. Clerics combine some of the advantages of the other two classes. The new class, Thieves, has the basic advantage of stealthful actions with some additions in order for them to successfully operate on a plane with other character types. If magic is unrestrained in the campaign, D&D quickly degenerates into a weird wizard show where players get bored quickly or the referee is forced to change the game into a new framework which will accommodate what he has created by way of player characters. It is the opinion of this writer that the most desirable game is one in which the various character types are able to compete with each other as relative equals. For that will maintain freshness in the campaign, providing that advancement is slow and there's always some new goal to strive for. This brings up the subject of new spells. 
The basic system allows for the players to create new spells for themselves at the option of the referee. It is certain that new spells will be added to the game system as a need arises, particularly with regard to new classes or subclasses of characters, or simply to fill in some needed gap. The creation of an endless number of more powerful spells is not desirable in the existing game system, and there is no intention of publishing 10th or higher level spells. As was said in the previous article, if character level progression is geared to the game system, it should take years for any magic user to attain a level where the use of 9th level spells is possible. As a last word regarding this subject, this D&D magic system explanation also serves another purpose. There should now be no doubt in Dungeon Master's minds with regard to the effect of a silent spell on a magic user or what will happen to the poor wizard caught in a mass of webs. They will know that a magic mouth is basically useless as a spellcaster with the exception of those spells which are based <clears throat> only on the verbal component of the spell. When an enterprising player tries a wizard lock on somebody's or something's mouth, he will not be prone to stretch the guidelines and allow it. Magic is great. Magic is powerful, but it should be kept great and powerful in relation to its game environment. That means all the magic users who have been coasting along with special dispensations from the dungeon master may soon have to get out there and root with the rest of the players or lie down and die. <laughs> so uh, I love how Gary puts this. Um, this article stems from back in the uh, Three Little Brown Books of OD&D. Um, you can tell that by his discussion about the Greyhawk supplement in the recent edition of the uh, the Thief class. Um, so that's back OD&D here. We're talking. Um, so this is pretty cool to hear the impetus of this, but he says something that I, I really agree with. Uh, two different things. I'm going to repeat those. Um, he says, if magic is unrestrained in the campaign, D&D quickly degenerates into a weird wizard show where players get bored more quickly or the referee is forced to change the game into a new framework which will accommodate with what he has created by way of player characters. It is the opinion of this writer that the most desirable game is one in which the various character types are able to compete with each other as relative equals. Doesn't say equals, says relative equals. For that will maintain, maintain freshness in the campaign, providing that advancement is slow and there's always some new goal to strive for. And then he says, magic is great, magic is powerful, but it should be kept great and powerful in relation to its game environment. Okay, that, that's extremely important. And I see in new systems, newer systems, um, I'm just going to pick on 5e and I'm going to pick on Pathfinder 2nd edition, but there are even 1st edition all the way back to, um, I think, D&D 3.0, um, the end of the 2nd uh, edition era, even just the constant continuous ramping up of power. Um, by 3rd edition 3.5, 1st edition uh, Pathfinder, then into 2nd edition Pathfinder, and now in 5th edition, it's just um, your magic users are gunslingers and they never run out of anything. Um, and I think that cheapens the game a lot uh, and that cheapens magic a lot. And it makes it just this unlimited um, resource, which doesn't make it magical anymore. Again, that's my humble opinion. You take that or leave that. Play your games however you want to play. Um, play your setting in your world however you want to play. Um, I am more inclined towards a token world where magic is low and rare. Um, but I have ran plenty of games and do for my family now that isn't that it that that isn't the case. Um, but I much prefer, given my choices, a, a setting where magic is a big deal. Um, it's significant, and when it happens, it's a big deal. Um, and so that's not just lying around everywhere. You can't just go buy it a dime or dozen or create it a dime or dozen with some crafting check and a little bit of coin. Um, that's just my personal opinion. Um, so anyway, I hope you've liked listening to uh, the Dungeons and Dragons Magic System by Gary Gygax from the Best of Dragon Volume 1 here. Um, I hope you like these types of videos. If you do, again, please uh, check out the uh, the description for the links to support me. Um, please share this around so that I can start ramping up my subscribers. And uh, I'd love for you to put some things in the comments and share your thoughts about this. Um, again, give me that thumbs up. I'd really appreciate that. And uh Hope you all take care, uh, prosper, and uh, good gaming. Later.